Um, oh yeah, Kian says next weekend. Yeah, same as everybody. Okay, cool. So uh, we're recording. Welcome back. Nice to see you all again. And oh, we have a good turnout. 13 today. Awesome. Um, and so today we have uh, Kirill and Derek, and I think I saw you guys coordinate that Derek's going to go first. Yeah, yeah, it will be easier to hit the time. Awesome. Okay. Uh, oh, also, okay, so cool. We'll start with Derek, but then uh, Kirill, I just noticed your mic was suddenly kind of hard to hear and muffled. It sounded great earlier or a mm. second ago when you first got in. Thank you. So let me... Uh... Okay, cool. So yeah, Derek, I know you've introduced yourself before, but I'm not sure it's been in the recording. So if, or it definitely has because you presented before, but still, if you want to just like reintroduce yourself and what you're working on and what you're showing us and then you can take it from there. Sure. Yeah, no, happy to. So uh, yeah, I'm Derek Yu. Uh, I'm with a, a company called Pure Stake. And um, I guess we've uh, been involved with Polkadot and uh, with Substrate for uh, maybe it's been about six months now. Um, you know, the first thing is we're, we are running a validator on the Kusama network and plan to run one on the, uh, on the Polkadot mainnet when it launches. So that was our first kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of engagement, I guess, with the, with the platform and with the, the technology. And, uh, but we have been working on a new project. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Josh, you were kind of enough to kind of give, you know, let me present here. I think that originally I'd kind of put these slides together for the San Francisco Sub-Zero conference that got canceled. So, um, you know, I had some, uh, you know, I had kind of a small presentation that just described the project. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's great to have an opportunity to kind of show it, uh, show it to you guys. Um, obviously, with a smaller audience like this, just feel free to jump in if there's any uh, kind of questions or, or anything comes up as I'm, as I'm going through it. Um, so uh, I, just the, the context on what we're doing, uh, the project is uh, uh, you know, going to be a parachain on Polkadot. But I'll just uh, give you a little bit of context on kind of how we got to you know, where we are in terms of our thinking, how we kind of arrived at uh, Substrate and Polkadot, um, just, just uh, to give context for, for the project. So you know, we, we kind of see this increasingly multi-chain uh, future. And in particular, you know, it's Cosmos and Polkadot, I think, are, are both projects that are driving you know, kind of spawning their own ecosystems of blockchains. So, you know, in our view, we kind of see this as just a permanent situation where there's going to be just many chains, many kind of tokens on those chains. And that's where, you know, this kind of um, this interoperability idea that is part of the, you know, the polka dot vision, um, uh, you know, really starts to make sense to us. Because if you're going to have these, this kind of permanently multi-chain future, it just makes sense that you know these chains will need to communicate you know with with one another, um, and uh, you know I think the this multi-chain kind of situation kind of creates you know some unique challenges in our view. So you know one is that you know as a user, if you're on or you know if you're on a particular chain, you kind of don't have access to a lot of the services that are available on other chains. So you know a lot of those are on Ethereum these days, right? So there's all these services on Ethereum, DeFi, other services. Uh, but they're kind of inaccessible if you're uh, if you're on your own chain. And then for developers, it's kind of the same problem where um, uh, you know you, you kind of have all these chains with different technology stacks. So the question is, okay, if I'm going to build a DApp, where do I build it? And you kind of have you know if if you know a lot of them end up being on Ethereum as well in this case because that's where there's some collection of of, of other uh, of, of users. Um, but, you know, we see that as there's a kind of a pretty big like long tail now of other chains with users on them that, you know, it's difficult to kind of convince developers to come because they have to like learn some specific technology stack and the market is kind of small. So you see that's kind of a, a problem. And then on the for the chains themselves, you know, we, we kind of see this problem where because there's not this good way to kind of interact between chains, you know, a lot of the a lot of what's happening is, you know, uh, tokens in particular, they move to centralized exchanges, right? So that's kind of what happens. And, you know, especially for the newer proof of stake chains, um, this is kind of a problematic, right? Because then all of a sudden, you know, folks like Binance and other centralized exchanges become, you know, very powerful players basically in the governance of those of those networks, uh, especially, you know, in, in kind of networks where the tokens serve uh, serve voting and governance functions. So um, yeah, I hadn't really put that last one together. That makes perfect sense. But like, yeah, if I've got all my tokens locked up in like Coinbase custody or you know whatever my favorite centralized exchange is, like they really have my voting power. Yeah, I think this has happened as you know, uh, especially as some of the you know some of these folks are launching, 
like no cost validation services. And they're kind of saying like, well, if you store your tokens with us, we'll kind of give you, you know, access to those things almost kind of quote for free. Um, you know, that, you know, I think on, on Tezos, for example, like, you know, now like finance is like one of the big players, like in terms of uh, Tezos, uh, you know, holdings and governance basically. So um, yeah, I think it's, you know, the, these are, um, and you know, it, it, these are just kind of things that I think that are going to continue to continue to kind of play out if there's not other options, right, for, for token holders. Um, so that, that's an interesting service that I hadn't heard of too. So there are, there are people who are offering like, we'll hold your tokens and keep them safe and we'll even let you stake them and make returns like without any fees, but then the like benefit that they're gaining is that they get to vote with the tokens. That's right. That's right. And I think for these big exchanges, they just want to get users onto their platform and they know they're going to make money off of like trading fees and other services they provide there. Mm -hmm. So I think they're just seeing these as kind of value adds, but you know, I mean, this is the kind of thing where when you're in kind of the standalone validator business like that, you know, that's kind of some, you're trying to kind of create a differentiated service just on kind of an independent basis. You know, I think it, mm -hmm. it kind of becomes a little tough, right? Because these bigger players have this whole kind of array of services they can, they can provide including you know, zero fee kind of kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, I think you know if the if enough of the tokens centralize onto those, then we kind of lose a lot of the the whole point of doing it in the first place, right? <laughs> Where you know there's kind of big players that kind of can sway things one way or another. Yeah, yeah, there are like benevolent overlords, and then all of a sudden it's up to them whether they're going to be benevolent in perpetuity or not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, so, you know, when we kind of went looking for this, um, you know, last year, uh, just a little context of how we ended up at Polkadot, you know, we really kind of looked, I think there's two chains that are kind of obvious to look at if you're kind of interested in these interoperability scenarios. So that's Polkadot and Cosmos. And, you know, our, our feeling, um, you know, in looking at this is that we felt strongly that, you know, that uh, Polkadot was, was the, the, you know, the, the, the technology we want to work with. I mean, we felt Substrate was like extremely powerful. I mean, I've learned Quite a bit, you know, from attending these sessions and from you, Joshi, but uh, you know, that's you know, quite uh, you know, quite powerful. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of the more structured design that Polkadot takes. You know, we believe will make cross-chain integration scenarios easier. You know, versus the more kind of loosely federated kind of approach that the Cosmos has. And then, you know, the the, the folks that we've been working with, um, you know, on the on the parity and Web three side have all been great. So, uh, you know, those are kind of some of the the reasons what led us down the kind of the Polkadot path. And uh, you know, so just getting a little bit you know, more into the you know, into the meat of what our project is, and um, uh, is that uh, you know we envision uh, being a smart contract parachain on Polkadot. So kind of why smart contracts, right? And I think our this kind of goes back to the you know substrate is like quite powerful, but it's also fairly complex. And you know our belief is that you know for teams that want to kind of access the interoperability and kind of the, the power of Polkadot. You know, for a lot of them, you know, uh, a smart contract based implementation is going to make sense versus a full substrate runtime. And, uh, you know, we've gotten some experience now just looking at these runtimes and there are kind of a number of things that you have to worry about when you're building a runtime that you don't have to worry about when you're uh, building a smart contract. So, um, you know, we kind of envision uh, our parachain being uh, kind of an easy on ramp or kind of an easy, an easy way to get onto Polkadot. Um, while, you know, kind of not having to worry about some of the things that you have to worry about when doing runtime development. So things like, um, you know, incentivizing node operators and, uh, you know, figuring out all the economics, all your token kind of economics of how the whole system's going to work. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, things around like um, running like, you know, full nodes and other services that you need to be able to provide, uh, you know, developer access. You know, these are all kind of things that come along with runtime development that aren't there when you're doing the smart contract implementation. Um, I'll talk in a minute about some, so obviously we benefit from all of the substrate ecosystem of tools and we have some other ones that we're going to add to that. Uh, I'll talk about uh, some of those uh, on the next slide. Uh, you know, I already spoke about, you know, uh, us being kind of very interested in this cross integration. So those are the scenarios that we're, you know, we're kind of interested in. And, um, you know, we're, we're generally, I think a lot of the scenarios that, um, you know, we're interested in supporting are, are DeFi oriented. So this is where we've been talking to several of the other projects building on Polkadot. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I have some kind of uh, scenario examples later on, but, you know, we're, we're kind of interested in, in creating uh, kind of a DeFi ecosystem or helping to provide a DeFi ecosystem on, on Polkadot. 
And uh, so I just wanted to talk here a little bit about, and you know, uh, I, I'll pause here for a moment also to talk about some of the, the tech that you know we envision building since this is kind of a technical session. Um, but a couple different kind of user audiences we're trying to appeal to. Uh, the first and foremost, I would say Ethereum developers, particularly those that are you know potentially hitting scalability limits, you know, on Ethereum. And so as part of being this easy on ramp, it, you know, some of the the tech that we're going to build that is going to enhance the substrate, you know, dev ecosystem would be tools to help Ethereum based projects like easily move over to uh, run uh, on Polkadot. And, uh, you know, so Carol, I think this is kind of very timely that, you know, given some of what you're going to show, um, you know, there's two parts to this in our mind. Um, you know, the, the first part um, is uh, the front end. So this would be like web3.js compatibility. So we have in mind creating basically a compatibility layer that would speak web3.js kind of on the front end that map back to substrate uh, runtime, you know, calls on the back end. And the idea there is that, you know, you'd be able to take an existing like front end Ethereum application and even some of the, the tools should also work like things like Truffle and kind of move them over to like, you know, to attach to uh, our parachain. Um, the back end is Solidity, right? So most of the contracts, existing Ethereum contracts out there are Solidity. And we're right now, we're kind of looking at a couple approaches. I mean, there's really looks like there's two approaches uh, to providing Solidity support. Uh, one of them, girls, I guess what you're gonna be showing here is the EVM frame palette is one. Uh, the yeah. second one is, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, working on kind of a uh, compiled to substrate compatible WASM, you know, kind of approach. And so we've been yeah, looking at the these two approaches. Is. Yeah, right. So we've been looking at these two approaches. I mean, I think there are some pros and cons to, to both of them. I think at this point, our feeling is the EVM frame palette approach is probably the safer approach. But um, there are some tricks here. And this is probably, I don't want to steal any of your thunder, Kirill, but, uh, you know, it, the EVM frame palette kind of runs as kind of this like black box inside of the subtrait runtime. It has its own accounts and own everything. So that's kind of a challenge because, you know, for the interoperability these other scenarios, we want to be just in the main runtime. And so we're starting to think, yeah, it's okay. Not that good integrated into substrate, I guess, comparing to solution is compiling to Wasm. That's right. I mean, well, I, I, right. So I think, you know, there's probably even some kind of like internal bridge that needs to be created or something to be able to make stuff that's inside of the EVM frame palette, like available to or kind of transferable to or visible to just the base substrate runtime. So, I mean, we're, we're still kind of in the early days of kind of thinking through these things, but that's, you know, that's kind of some of the, the, the paths that we're, uh, that, that we're going down. And uh, yeah, so I'll, you know, I'll be interested Carol, to see kind of uh, you know, some of the work that, uh, that you've done on, on this side. Um, you got a quick question. I, this maybe is for either one of you. I'm not really sure. Uh, that first point makes a ton of sense. Like if you're looking to attract Ethereum developers, obviously Solidity is something they're very familiar with. And then like the front end piece, the web three JS or ethers JS or whatever they use is like another huge piece of the tool chain that they're familiar with and will want to continue using. And uh, like do those things, Substrate doesn't currently have an API for those libraries to call into, right? Like it stuff has to be translated or something. Is that the other yeah. piece you're talking about? That's right. I mean, for the, for the, the front end part, I mean, uh, what we mentioned is creating, you know, some sort of, of a compatibility layer or translation layer, right? It would speak web three JS on one side and then it would yeah. you know, map back to, uh, you know, other calls like, you know, substrate runtime compatible calls on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think again, we're kind of early days in this. So it's probably one of those things that's a little bit easier said than done, but uh, I yeah. think it should be, should be doable. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and that's kind of, that's kind of the idea is to kind of like lower the friction for an existing Ethereum based project to kind of, let's say, you know, kind of move over to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, Polkadot. Yeah. And, uh, Kind of so, the vision there is that it's like there's it's kind of cool because if you, you use that as a starting point you can always kind of upgrade later to like your own substrate runtime but at least you kind of don't aren't forced to like just rewrite your entire thing as a substrate runtime you know right off the bat yeah this is the thing you use to kind of get people hooked and realize like oh i like the ecosystem yeah. that's, that's yeah. right that's so right. is one of the approaches like i you know having thought about this for like 20 seconds this might not really make sense but like is the idea to add an rpc to the substrate node that basically works the same as like the geth node or the open ethereum node or is it like a different like a layer that sits in between that does the translation and relay i think it, it should be part of the the node i mean otherwise it's kind of just like a centralized 
service that would be sitting, yeah, right. uh, you know, sitting outside. So that's obviously less good. So it somehow be uh, need to be like in the in the node. But uh, like I said, I mean, I think we're still pretty early on the uh, kind of thinking through exactly how this would work. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the second thing, you know, uh, the second kind of set of users would be folks that want to work with BTC. Um, you know, this is where, um, you know, we've spoken to some of the teams that are building, you know, bridges, you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, recently announced there's Interlay is one of the groups building a BTC to Polkadot bridge. You know, that would allow for, um, they're calling it Polka BTC, so kind of like a wrapped version of BTC would then be on the Polkadot network. And, um, you know, our belief is that there is, demand to be able to work with, you know, to build apps that can work with BTC in kind of a high performance way. Um, so, you know, that's, that's interesting uh, to us, um, you know, to kind of target that, that scenario. That, of course, is, depends on, you know, further, po you know, Polkadot developments post mainnet launch, you know, then you know, this would require basically the um, uh, kind of a token movement, you know, scenarios to be enabled, right? So cross-chain token movement scenarios to be enabled for people to be able to move these you know, onto our chain. Um, you know, I think this is cut off a little bit, but you know, we're kind of planning on doing this this year. We have a plan of um, uh, of uh, uh, deploying to Kusama first. Um, you know, we're just where we are right now. Uh, I said we're, you know, I kind of done the POC work that I shared earlier, kind of over the holidays, and um, you know, we're kind of building out the the team now to go uh, to go tackle this. Uh, Telmo, who's on the, the call here, is uh, one of the engineers uh, working on this. And uh, you know we have another engineer starting uh, in April, and uh, you know we're looking to kind of build up the team to kind of go tackle this. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, you know the analogy I use when I'm trying to explain kind of like the the, the vision here is that I kind of use this the bash of polka dots. So uh, bear with me on this analogy, but it's kind of like if polka dots like Linux, then Substrate is like the standard C library. And it's kind of this old Unix philosophy of like, you know, do one thing and do it well, as I think is kind of applies to these parachains on Polkadot. So kind of in that context, we're trying to be the bash, right? So it's kind of like this lighter weight, simpler place where these things can be combined uh, to achieve, you know, interesting results. And, uh, you know, just like on Linux, if you need more performance and control and everything, you know, then you'd move to kind of a native application. So that would be like a, a substrate runtime. Uh, but there's still a place for this kind of simpler, um, you, know, you know, simpler environment where, you know, you can still compose and combine, you know, different tools together. And, you know, so kind of a futuristic, you know, uh, I, I realize it's futuristic, but kind of a North Star scenario for us would be, so let's say I give the example here of like a, a compound-like protocol. So for those of you not familiar, Compound's a DeFi protocol in Ethereum that allows for lending and borrowing. So, you know, uh, I would think like a great scenario that would showcase the power of Polkadot would be something like, um, a compound supporting uh, BTC and uh, the Akala stablecoin on the other end. Um, you know, we could use the interlay BTC bridge as an example to move BTC onto our chain. The Akala is another project on Polkadot that's building a stablecoin that's like, um, uh, you know, that's um, uh, like DAI. So move that onto our chain. And then Chainlink's another team we've been speaking with that's going to be providing, you know, Oracle services onto, onto Polkadot. So they could provide a decentralized, you know, BTC USD price feed. And then you have, you know, the th three ingredients you would need to be able to create, uh, you know, a money market or compound like uh, uh, protocol, uh, you know, combining those ingredients like on, on Moonbeam. So not something that's going to be possible right away. There's a lot of, you know, technical kind of things being worked on that are prerequisites would need to enable something like this, but this is the kind of, uh, the kind of scenario that is like we find very interesting, right? And we think that, you know, you look at this scenario versus um, some of how it works on Ethereum right now, it's going to be way more scalable by having each of these components like in their own, you know, with their own like blockchain um, that are kind of all interacting, you know, via Polkadot versus you know, having them all on one chain, right? Uh, so, um, so yeah. that's... That. So those like three bullets at the bottom are like examples of do one thing and do it well, I guess, right? Like the Akala chain is a stable coin and it does that well and like chain link is uh you know this oracle thing and does that well neither one of them try to be the whole like monolithic solution and so like i guess moonbeam's piece that you're describing here is like being able to compose those things to get like uh, am i thinking of it the right way that's right that's right yeah that's right yeah that's that's right 
I mean, you know, just, I do think your point about, you know, the, the one, the do one thing and do it well, I mean, is important to us because I do feel like, you know, the chains that aren't part of a network now, they do try to do everything, right? You're, you kind of get pulled into doing everything, right? It's like, oh, you need to be good money. You need to be good at smart contracts. You need to be good at, you know, all of these things. And it's just hard to do that, right? I mean, you kind of end up being kind of maybe just okay at yeah, several right. things, but not really good at, at, at any one thing. Yeah, right, exactly. So, our, all right, so I have a question, Derek, and if this is coming yeah. up, that's that's fine, answer it whenever. Um, yeah, so fine. like, as you mentioned, you came on a few months ago and presented, you know, like a really early preview of Moonbeam. And at that time it was operating as like a decentralized exchange. I forget the name of the kind of exchange. I remember it operates like Uniswap, but I forget the yep, name of yep, it. Yep, that's right. What's the name of that kind of like protocol or? Yeah, it was, it was kind of inspired by Uniswap, right? It, it, it was yeah. kind of similar to that. Yeah, cool. Okay, so now um, you've got this idea about like the, the smart contract features. So is it, um, is it like both of those things or is it sort of a pivot no. toward the smart contracts? It's a pivot towards the smart contracts thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. I think we, we definitely, I mean, we envision, you know, I think that it would be great uh, to have someone building that kind of thing like on top of Moonbeam, but uh, we mm -hmm. kind of, I think, you know, this is... Um, you know, we did uh, more work on kind of just the practical realities of like launching a DEX. I mean, we're based in the U.S., so there were some oh, yeah. and some other challenges like with that. And so I think we kind of, you know, kind of uh, backed away from that. Right? There were some yeah. practical, practical challenges related to that. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave you with, um, you know, we have uh, we haven't announced it yet. So we'll be announcing this in the next, uh, you know, uh, the next couple of weeks. Uh, we do have a website that's that, that's up um, that uh, you know you guys can look at moonbeam.network, um, and uh, you know we're just interested in collaborating with other uh, projects in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, for anyone on the call, you know we're I'm totally interested in in uh, you know, talking to anyone uh, on that end. Um, you know, we're also looking for uh, substrate, Rust, Solidity tooling kind of backend developers. So we'd be very interested in speaking with you if you're you know any one of those things or have interest in you know, uh, working on, on this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly on email. I put my email and my uh, right handle uh, down, down in the corner. Yeah, awesome. Looking forward to checking out the website. Yeah, moonbeam.network. Yeah, I can, uh, I mean, let's see if I have it here. I can just maybe pull it up. If you guys can see here, this is, uh, this is the website that kind of describes a lot of what I just described. Yeah, I dig the theme. I like that icon at top too. Yeah, I think it was we we're going for like a. It's it kind of has this like, you know these these colors. I think it was kind of like Miami, like South Beach, like nineteen eighty, like drive-in burger joint or something. I think is the, <laughs> the way that our designer described it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the update, Derek. Sure. No, I appreciate the appreciate it. Thanks very much. And uh, okay, cool. So Kirill, I guess you're gonna take us into some of the technical aspects that might be relevant yeah. for that project and maybe other yeah, projects. Yeah, it's really since relevant. Yeah. Uh, one second. Yeah. Always forgetting that. Green button. Okay, you see my screen? Yeah, I guess. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, now we see it looks good. Yeah, I have two repos to, to present uh, today. Uh, the first one is Substrate EM enabled. Uh, it is uh, modified, not template, is uh, enabled uh, EVM module. Uh, and uh, this uh, we will use uh, just to, uh, to query node. And uh, tooling for uh, Solidity, uh, well, it's very basic tooling, but uh, it's implemented with this repo, so feel free to see how I do. So first of all, I will explain how to enable EVM in a node template. So first of all, we are interested in a uh, template chain stack. And it usually will be modified generate this config, we add fill with EVM. And uh, this will find our initial state of our EVM palette. And we add user edit. 
with uh, one million of users. And I should uh, mention that uh, EVM uses uh, its own uh, ledger for uh, tracking balance of users. So uh, here, and it also uses uh, separate uh, addresses. So here we convert account ID. This uh, Alice account ID is a normal substrate uh, address. And we convert it uh, to uh, EVM address with a uh, way to hash it and with some casing. So, yeah, and the most important that it's separate ledger. And uh, after this, yeah, we of course need to add dependency to EVM values in our target zone. Also, we need to provide our state in the mutation. So, all right. So, Kirill, I've got a question already yeah. about that EVM config that you were just showing. So, that was like your Genesis config for the chain, right? Right. Okay. And so, like, uh, a lot, most of this I'm pretty familiar with. Like, on line 136, you set up your, you know, balances. That's like the regular substrate balances palette. And then, like, down on 147. Yeah, everything, everything this is default. And uh, what has changed is uh, basically only. Okay, cool. And so then I see like one, uh, oh, I guess, yeah, like the only thing you're configuring there is a accounts, which is a vector and your, ve your vector in this case has just a single element and it's, oh, I see. Okay, so you're yeah, just right, giving right. Yeah. Alice an account ID and you're setting her nonce to zero. Oh, okay. And then so like, okay, so Alice has an ETH balance down on like 152 that's uh, totally separate from her like substrate uh balances palette balance i guess does that seem right yes yes uh so it will when we run the node it will have default uh, value of substrate balance it's something like one million bitcoin and also uh this one million of me and we convert uh balance uh, like one bitcoin is uh something like 10 and 12 uh, degree right uh, in normal substrate and this one million is uh, just million. And so uh, that coin is uh, 10 and 12 degrees, so it's one in the lot of zero. And uh, this is much smaller than uh, one million that coin. Okay. Yeah. So also we need to implement a uh, trade, for example, he tried to link. So we use this uh, import for uh, trade declaration and uh, this for truncating uh, account ID after we uh, hashed it with wait to. So it could wait. Yeah, uh, basically this uh, is necessary only for uh, uh, providing us with contest price. So we can configure it, for example, 200, and uh, we will not able to set the uh, gas price for our uh, transaction less than 100. But for simplicity, it's just the one. Uh, yeah, and so, can, can, you, you, can you give a bit, like, I, I think I'm lacking a bit of context. So, so this is the conversion from gas to, like, so from EVM gas to substrate right. fees? Yes. Yes, uh, and can, it's multiplied uh, uh, like uh, when we execute the contract, we spend some gas. This gas multiplies gas price, and this uh, is the uh, amount of how much we will spend of our EVM use. And here, actually, several conversions like we first we uh, need to deposit the uh, account with our substrate uh, units. Then these EVM units are spent for gas. So, yeah, two conversions. And uh, this, but this is minimal gas and because it's not a uh, fixed uh, conversion. We can specify a bigger price of gas for uh, our transaction. For example, 10. Uh, so, where's the part? Units per one gas. So, I get, I kind of, I think I get min gas price, like you don't want to allow any, 
you know, operations to cost less than one gas in the EVM. But where's the part where you say like, you know, apart from the minimum, you know, let's say I make some contract call that's going to end up costing me like 100 gas or like, I actually don't even know what's a reasonable number, but let's just say like 100 gas. Where's the part where you say you like, okay, for those particular transaction, right? Yeah, well, what was that? Is this uh, determined uh, when we already submit a transaction, this will be uh, in next part. This is already a uh, like user level when we submit transaction to our we yeah. specify it uh, every time. Okay. Yeah. Can you maybe start from the, more from the user perspective of like, what will the experience of using the EVM palette be like? Yeah, like uh, you upload the uh, contract and uh, when you already create the uh, contract, you specify just price because the constructor is called and some instructions are executed to build the state of contract. So we spend uh, gas and to like the higher uh, gas price, the more um, probable that uh, your transaction will be first uh, if there are lots of uh, transactions to process. So basically, it's uh, yeah fee. So the bigger price, the bigger fee. The faster your transaction is processed. Uh, Carol, so the, it's the case though that like, I mean, the EVM, this, it, it's like its own island inside of the substrate runtime, right? So yeah, it has its right. own balance, its own, like the same kind of like gas rules as one would find on Ethereum or kind of apply in yeah. there. But as an end user. Is that I actually from live demonstration uh, before you go to code. But basically we covered already uh, the most of code, like we implement this trade. Yeah, it's uh, possible to look up. So let's uh, we move to uh, operating this node itself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but just so I understand, like basically, like you know, my, my understanding is that you know you have this EVM kind of running inside of the substrate runtime. You still can only interact with that substrate runtime in the ways that we know about. So that's like RPC calls, exposed RPC mm -hmm. calls to the substrate runtime, and then in turn from there you would invoke like inside of the runtime you would invoke you know, potentially yeah. like a smart contract, can, like functions show. exposed by the EVM palette, right? It's like something like that. Yes, right. So yeah, let's uh, then look at the methods itself. For example, like uh, we have uh, this runtime call, like create. This is a normal uh, substrate call. And uh, we have create, we have uh, create two, there is also a call. Yeah, withdraw and deposit. So uh, deposit and withdraw is uh, communication uh, between our internal island of EVM and external uh, substrate infrastructure. And call is a normal substrate method uh, which uh, then executes EVM code inside. So it's basically, it's uh, almost the same as uh, contract credit. And the only difference that it uh, has its own separate ledger, and uh, for interacting with it, we have two additional methods. So you've created like wrapper, like substrate runtime, like wrapper functions that have exposed RPC endpoints that then allow you to like call all the way through into like EDM based smart contract. Functions. Yeah, like it's, yeah, it's built like this. Yeah, but the uh, remark is that uh, it's not me who built this uh, run. It's uh, uh, built uh, by data. Uh, and I uh, only implemented uh, tooling for this. Got it. And uh, this uh, repo is uh, enabled EVM. Yeah. But so yeah, I it's think uh, like this. Is, is it correct that it's um, like these calls we're seeing here, yeah, like it's inside the decal module block. So these are like dispatchable calls. So in the same way that like the balances palette has a transfer call or like um, the system palette has a remark call, for example, then this palette just has calls like deposit balance, which I guess like uh, lets you 
put some balance into the EVM's ETH or like the, there was a really interesting one down there called, I think maybe just call or call contract or something. And that's how you like interact with the actual Ethereum smart contract that lives inside this thing. Yes, that's correct. But let's, let's, uh, we will run node and uh, it probably will be uh, more clear uh, how to call work. So here is link for Docker. I mean, command how to run the container. Uh, of course, you can check. If somebody has, uh, doesn't have Docker, uh, then uh, can run just binary. Add to Google Drive. Uh, yeah. I'm personally using Podmins. So now we started our node and we can glance at uh, our metadata. So this is a uh, metadata from substrate node, right? So there is a uh, lot of different information. Uh, there are modules. Yeah, that's already yeah. yeah. So this uh, all metadata about our runtime module for EVM. And we have also here different another modules like template module. To the module, yeah, transaction payment, etc. Uh, so, and here describe uh, what we have in our storage. So, this section items. So, we have uh, account is our ledger for uh, tracking balances, which is separate, separate items from substrate. We have account code. It's uh, our contract code. It is compiled by code for every contract which is implemented in our EVM. So that's like if this, so if I remember right in the EVM, there's accounts and each account can have some code associated with it. And if it has the code, that means it's a smart contract as opposed to like my account that I have a key for, for example. And so is that yeah. the storage item that you're showing here, this thing called account codes, that's where the, like the EVM byte code for your smart contract yeah, lives? Yeah, that's program code for, like when we uh, essentially have contract, we build some byte code uh, address, and this uh, is the mapping of it. I can show it in code also. It's my code will show it. So this, yeah, this prefilled. We can uh, like if we don't have access to code, we can get the same information from metadata. And uh, yeah, so account code is this mapping from our addresses to just byte vectors, which are our byte codes. Yeah, and also we have account storages field which is uh, storage for every contract. It has, uh, it's memory which we can write to or read. Uh, they are stored uh, variables, fields, etc. So yeah, it's also mapping from uh, address to H256. Yeah. Okay. It's always uh, 256 yeah. bits. This makes sense, I think. So this you're showing us the EVM palette here, and it's like the whole EVM palette only has these three storage items, and one is like just the accounts, and that's kind of like what you showed us at the beginning in your Genesis config, where like Alice yeah. had some balance and, and stuff. And then there's yeah, the right, account so. codes, and that yeah. was like uh, that was like the that's the byte code for yeah, exactly this thing. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, nonce and balance, I guess each account has. Um yeah. Okay, and then the last thing was storages, and that's because like inside the EVM, each EVM smart contract has its own storage. So this is how we map like an individual contract's 
storage within the EVM back to what's ultimately substrates underlying storage. Yes, correct. So, yeah, we like. And from technical side, here is like nested storage. So we use substrate storage uh, and uh, used double nest uh, primitive uh, in it uh, to store our EVM storages. This is like the Merkle tree that's like, or the, that uh, that's uh, associated with like the smart contract, basically, right? Like, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's Merkle tree on substrate level, but uh, here it's just nest. All right. In assuming that H160 is the identifier that's also used for the account in the account codes. Yeah, H160 yeah. is uh, here. It's always uh, address. Uh, it uses uh, 160 bit for address. Right, so it's the, the account address. And then the H256 is, is an identifier that's chosen by the contract. So it would be, I don't know, if I have a, if I have a field in my contract where I want to, like some variable where I want to store stuff that, that gets hashed to this H256, is that right? Yeah, okay. right. Yeah, so I think we can move to canvas. I'm just, uh, I think it's useful to know that uh, every information is available from metadata. So I think I'll show here. Yeah, so that's our uh, code to EVM depository with drop balance call. Yeah, and this is uh, what we define in the module. Yeah, we already seen. Yeah, and uh, like what arguments of this uh, call? Let's start from create. We say uh, so init is a bytecode we upload for our smart contract. It's a uh, program. Uh, value is uh, what we attach to message, uh, like the balance to transfer. Gas limit is uh, what uh, how much uh, gas we are ready to spend for this uh, execution. Uh, and execution in the case of the create method is uh, instantiation of contract, so running it from first. And the get price, which is important for this. Yeah, and uh, optional demand. Well, this call is uh, basically the same, but it also, it, instead of uh, init value, so init value is a uh, bytecode. Uh, we uh, can pass input this call. It's uh, just binary data to uh, pass to contract and it is also used to select which method we will run. Yeah, so it, it's also used for what? Uh, to dispatch methods. For example, let's open some program. For example, Twitter. So this is constructor, it's uh, like default. Uh, and uh, if we want to run uh, method flip, then uh, we should somehow to tell this, like we send message to address, which uh, uh, bind it to uh, bytecode. But here we don't have any symbolic name of uh, the function to call. Like here is value trans uh, transfer, gas limit, gas price. Target is uh, address to send message. Uh, this balance and input is uh, binary encoded data. So basically, we encode this flip signature into binary data and pass it into this argument. Yeah, but I will show in a couple of seconds. Let's uh, let's start with. Simple thing. 
Yeah, okay, that sounds familiar now. I'm remembering like when you when you call into an Ethereum smart contract, you have to give it this like encoded version of which one of the uh, various functions it is that you're trying to call, right? So that's what you're saying that VEC U8 was like the encoded version of the name of the, the function you're calling? Yeah, right. I will also show a bit of code uh, how this uh, encoding performs. Okay. Mm. It's like so, the ABI, right? This is like the Ethereum ABI. Yeah, that's, that's the standard. Yeah. That, it's like their version of this, basically, right? It's like kind of a mapping yeah, of all the right. functions. But, uh, I, uh, it's uh, quite interesting how it uh, is done in uh, Ethereum. Like, uh, like I'm not an expert in Solidity and Ethereum. Like uh, that was uh, just everything I discovered for me first time when I started to work with Ethereum. Like, but uh, they basically just take this text representation, or if uh, here is some argument, uh, they just take this. Sorry. Yeah. So, what is the question? Okay. So, they take uh, the complete signature with all arguments, uh, removing spaces. Ah. Yes, not in Montes, but uh, the same as it's uh, written in uh, Solidity code. And we just uh, put it into a hash, uh, hash function, and uh, that's uh, the selector to use. So it's uh, possible to derive uh, the selector uh, without uh, having the code, basically. Yeah, but I'll show. Yeah. So let's. Uh, I have some tool uh, which I implemented in TypeScript. This uh, will uh, show us all events from here. It's also possible to do this for the .js apps, but uh, this filtering is it will be easier. Yeah. And also, we can glance at uh, balancer. So right now, Alice has uh, a bit more than one million of that. Sorry. And this small utility is also supports even more. So here we see this is our uh, EVM address of Alice. So it's different from uh, address of Alice uh, in Substrate. It's converted with break two and notation. And this is uh, what we defined in our Genesis config. It's mm -hmm. one million of uh, EVM units. And let's uh, transfer some amount to EVM balance of okay, Alice from uh, your substrate. EVM is coming to this and amount of one that sorry. So we sign yeah. So this is 10 and 12 degree. I guess. Yeah. And we see that uh, our substrate balance of Alice is uh, subtracted with one get point and uh, it's implemented uh, inside of EVM ledger with uh, 10 and 12. So you yeah. created like a, a bridge, like a token bridge between like the substrate runtime and the EVM frame palette, and you just specified some exchange rate, I guess, where like some number of dev tokens yeah, on this yeah. runtime just equals some like amount of uh you know eth, eth inside the evm palette do you, yeah, you just uh, use right, like a one-to-one yeah. -one mapping or something or like uh... yeah it's one-to-one -one mapping yeah correct i got it uh, okay. it's just uh here is displayed in dev coins but uh, uh it uh, it is actually just one dev coin is multiplication by 10 and 12 so it's really subtracted uh, 10 and 12 here and 
implement the tenant job here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just. Uh, so, so wait, hold on. I have a question. Mm -hmm. where, where is the conversion factor uh, between the ETH tokens and the like balances palette tokens? Is that uh, did can, you specify that, or is that like hard coded somewhere? Uh, I guess it's hard coded. Yeah, I feel oh, like this is where okay. it's like almost you want like maybe the it to be just the same token that can either live in one or the other, or if they're different, then you got to have some market exchange mechanism maybe or something, right? To... Yeah, probably. But yeah, it's uh, it's just uh, there is no notion of like different units is just the same unit. Just you take value from substrate ledger and. We convert on the account ID yes. because uh, because in substrate uh, is uh, generic and in uh, EVM is uh, coded to H one to six. So okay, so the number, so the reason that it subtracted like one dev token, but gave you, I, I'm not sure how many zeros it was, but in like ten thousand or a hundred thousand ETH tokens is this because this part, uh, this part, uh, like ten and twelve degree or ten fifteens in some yeah. uh, chains, uh, that that part is uh, uh, substrate related part. I don't yeah. remember okay. where exactly, but I have seen somewhere once uh, where it is i guess it can be something like for dollar mm. so uh, am i getting this right so it, you 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 uh, tease apart or you have two implementations of the account balance because in principle you want to be able to separate the underlying substrate um coin whatever uh, substrate balance from the balance in the Ethereum virtual machine that you're running. So in principle, you want to be able to separate it. That's why they're separate. But in this demo, you just made it a straight, straightforward conversion because you didn't want to go through the trouble of having some sort of, I don't know, economic yeah. blah, what is like some sort of exchange or is it like, yeah, thing. So in principle, it's possible. It's just like simplified here for the demo purpose. Is that right? Well, uh, like, Again, I don't want to steal credits. Like the, the author of EVM model is Wei Tang. Uh, I'm just demonstrating it uh, because uh, I made some uh, tooling around it uh, to, uh, like, to make it demonstrable to uh, to see that it works. Like, but uh, technically, like you uh, can, uh, it's supposed that you just implement your runtime module or uh, write. Uh, JavaScript code uh, to make the entire your logic uh, working with this module, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just a one-to-one -one conversion uh, from Substrate to EVM module. Uh, I think it's like like why not? Because we can, uh, if uh, for example we want to create a chain with based on substrate, which works with uh, solidity to smart contracts, and then we just uh, can configure uh, everything uh, about tokens in the substrate level, and uh, EVM just uh, uses uh, the same token as for external substrate. Right. Okay, so, um, so the pallet EVM has these two dispatchable calls, withdraw and deposit. And those are what allow you to convert some external token into like ETH tokens in the EVM palette. And anybody can call them anytime they want. Uh, and you just use that command line tool to call it just a, a little bit ago, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, so I can you show us JavaScript code how this deposit is performed, actually. I think this is a little bit of the trick is that this, you know, this EVM frame palette will faithfully run Solidity smart contracts, but it's a little bit, it gets pretty confusing pretty fast when there's like a whole separate set of like accounts and state in there versus like in your runtime. So, you know, kind of immediately you're faced with these questions of, okay, well, do I try to 
make it that it's like you know you kind of have you have one set of money in the in the runtime and then you can transfer it like to and from the runtime and the and and the EVM or you know it's kind of like a yeah uh, it's I think it's like you know there's it's potentially like a little bit um there's potential for confusion from an end user perspective if there's like different yeah. concepts of where your tokens can be basically yeah uh yeah, it's really a bit confusing, um, but uh, I don't know, I think it also can be uh, uh, simple to do because like if you run uh, some contracts, then you don't want uh, the contracts uh, to like it's like security border between your real uh, wallet and uh, a wallet which you dedicate to uh, contracts. That's right. Right, it can like it can like drain all the funds in like the EVM account, but yeah, you're still yeah, yeah. your like substrate version of the same account like could still, you know, have you know be safe kind of thing, right? Yeah, it's like virtual machine. Like if you don't know what you're running, uh, probably it's uh, better to run it in virtual machine. So hey, Kirill, I wondered if you could show us the EVM palettes configuration trait real quick. I'm guessing it has some notion of a currency in there, and like in this. You mean uh, config, right? What was that? You mean Genesis config? Yeah, I think it probably has somewhere it says like pub trait trait. Mm -hmm. And ah. I just I just wondered if there's I it's suspect the that there must be a notion of a currency that we can give it and like probably when you put it in the node template runtime you told it like use the balances palette. Or it's something a like normal that. currency, actually. But yeah, yeah, I think uh, I should have shown from the very beginning. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, so it requires the system palette and the timestamp palette. That makes sense. And that, oh yeah, right. On line 128, it has some notion of a currency. So I'm, my thought is like, if you wanted to do something that like makes your substrate node act more natively like an EVM or like an Ethereum node, like you might be able to, instead of using the balances palette here, like write your own currency implementation where, you know, whatever you like, let's say I call, you know, transfer on whatever the currency notion is here that could like map into actually just using the EVMs ETH tokens or something. So I'm, I'm wondering if you might be able to hide this distinction if you wanted to. I, I don't think I have a fully like concrete idea yet, but that might be a possibility. You mean uh, to distinguish currency used in the substrate layer and uh, currency used in EVM modules? Yeah. I think it's possible, no, but it like, it would make sense if we would do EVM modules uh, I'm not sure, like, uh, yeah, like something what is built on EVM module, uh, some additional logic, and uh, then we, like, we, we would have, uh, like, top level substrate uh, ledger and uh, two uh, lower level uh, EVM ledger. And to distinguish uh, these EVM ledgers, we would uh, need uh, different currencies. But for the case when we have only one EVM model, I think it's uh, like it's okay to just uh, perform one to one mapping and uh, just for simplicity. Does it make sense? What, sorry, I missed that last bit. What did you say? Uh, I'm saying that uh, I think it's uh, just a simpler implementation and uh, that's enough actually because like if you, yeah, like what's the point to have uh, two different currencies for it? Yeah. yeah. Only yeah. if we have several EVM implementations. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. Or like if we use the chain not only for EVM smart contracts but also for Another module probably one currency would work one way with them, and another currency would work with Lit. But I don't know. It's I think it's 
there is a lot of space for speculation, but yeah, mm -hmm. for uh, this investment detection is one to one. Mm -hmm. Confused earlier because of the fixed conversion ratio, like you sort of you made the effort to separate the cur the currencies, and then you just had a fixed conversion that wouldn't allow like, yeah. And I guess your point about like oh the Ethereum account can run out of funds uh, funds without sort of impacting the other account. I guess is some sort of point, but I, I'm guessing what you're talking about makes more sense to me that like you might want to run the EVM. Uh, and then have some other pallet doing other stuff and you want to use your currency for it and then maybe you'll have some conversion rate of like how to transfer one one currency into the other and then it makes sense to separate them I guess. yeah so this is uh to link i use Sorry, my web storm is out of license, so I think it's uh, easier to open in it. So it's probably, if I open a subline, there will be a writing. Deposit funds, how to do this operation of transferring between ledgers. Yeah, it's quite straightforward. So we just need signer. It's uh, basically like uh, there is enough uh, of knowledge first. The chapters of tutorial for JS API. So I have a small wrapper send and return collate, like MV construct transaction with deposit balance and the value. And uh, the signer uh, acts uh, as uh, also a target of this operation. So uh, by default, like here we specify uh, C, so it's uh, the account uh, which we use to sign the transaction. And uh, this uh, account is used to uh, convert its address into EVM address. Uh, this one from this. And it is used to submit to this uh, transaction. Yeah, how to convert uh, convert the uh, address? Yeah, uh, address is converted in EVM module itself. Here. So let's now uh, create some smart contract. We have uh, funds in our EVM uh, balance. Let's go to Linux AV and yeah, I guess. Most people know this idea and uh, know uh, this uh, smart contract. So it's a flicker. We have only a, a Boolean uh, field and uh, we change it to the opposite with uh, one operation and get its uh, state with another. But uh, right now in EVM, it is not implemented to retrie retrieval of uh, return value. Uh, so I will uh, demonstrate how it works uh, with uh, uh, small trick I implemented in uh, the in this repo, substrate. Here. 
So yeah, let's compile. So this uh, JSON contains our uh, object and also user symbol in function. We copy the file code, go to demo, and uh, yeah, for this I use create command of this utility type CDN. We provide several arguments. First one is endowment. It's uh, balanced to transfer this method. For uh, example, one that one. Then uh, gas price. This is the one. And gas limit it will be enough for future just half million of gas. And code. So and uh, yeah, we copy paste this code. Yeah, so we uh, uploaded this contract into EVM module. Uh, these two events, uh, it's a custom events which are implemented in uh, that uh, port. Uh, we uh, can see in uh, events log that uh, storage was released uh, during construction of uh, one contract and we also wrote something on this index, just the zero index, uh, because as clippers, so we have only one field and it uh, has a zero offset. Yeah, this is address of our uh, contract, uh, which uh, was instantiated. It's also duplicated here. This created event is official EVM event, which uh, is uh, emitted all the time uh, when we instantiate code. These two are custom. Yeah, let's, uh, I show what so, this. Carol, I just want to make sure I, I was following here. So basically yeah, you right. just instantiated this contract uh, in the EVM that created events in the EVM. And then you've kind of bridged those events back or at least some of them, right? So that those events in the EVM then triggered like a, like substrate runtime events, like in the, in the runtime and that's what Yes, that's normal runtime, uh, substrate runtime events. Yeah, you can I see. So, but you had to like, well, you wired that up, right? So you wired up basically for these things happening in the EVM, trigger then like these like substrate runtime events to, to happen so that I have visibility from the runtime of what's happening, something like this. Yes, yes, sounds like this. Yeah. So this, uh, the EVM itself, like uh, this, we are looking uh, at the code of my uh, fork. Uh, and this selected log and created events, they are uh, standard events. These two I implemented solely for demonstration purposes. And uh, like, uh, yeah, so you can glance in the second file. So the EVM events coming through this as substrate events, that's part of Palette EVM, I think, right? Like if you install Palette EVM, that just happens for you? Yes, right. So for example, log events, they deposited here. In, this is method, uh, yeah, uh, like it's record for uh, some activity which is uh, going in, in EVM itself. Uh, and EVM itself is in another repo. Like uh, it's basically uh, called Okay, yeah, but I can show it in another so. Oh, I just made a like tangential observation. Looking at this cargo Tamil file, you're building off of like the um, the 2.0 alpha four that comes from crates.io. 
Is that right? Instead of like Git dependencies? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, cool. I, uh, I haven't seen that before. I, well, I replaced it just yesterday. It was like, uh, yeah, but it uh, creates some small problems when you uh, are trying to uh, have your project uh, up to date with very recent changes in subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, like also disclaimer uh, that this uh, part is uh, not for production usage, certainly because uh, like uh, in order to uh, sync these uh, latest substrate changes, uh, I uh, had to make small <laughs> this commit yeah basically this stuff was removed uh, in last week uh, but uh, it could be simpler to just return it in my port <laughs> to make it compile yeah it's just uh, as I understand to it was removed from uh, no SPG environment but the runtime is always no SPG so uh, I had to remove uh, turn it back yeah and this uh, is EVM itself it's a project of uh, Vietnam and here are much more uh, files than just to backend and liberalize like here is everything happening Yeah, and uh, this uh, pellet EVM is uh, just a wrapper around uh, this uh, Rust EVM. Project. Yeah, I think that's actually like a kind of an insightful observation and like explains why we have this thing that we've talked about where like there's a separate ETH token inside of this pellet EVM that's separate from like whatever your notion of currency is and like most of this yeah. palette, like, like writing this palette was not that big of a task because it depends on a crate called that you were showing Rust EVM and Rust EVM was already written. Like I think a popular Ethereum classic client uses it. And so like really what this palette does is just wraps that Rust EVM crate with the corresponding like uh, substrate extrinsics like deposit and withdraw and call and the other ones you showed us. Yeah, I guess like, yeah, it was implemented separately and then breached into a substrate. Uh, but I actually didn't know about Ethereum Classic, but yeah, probably then it's also explained. Yeah, so I, I lost track what we were doing, actually. So, ah, yeah, so we uploaded a uh, contract. Yes, I wanted to show how uh, this storage has been uh, generated. So this uh, is a modification which allows us to see uh, all rights uh, performed to storage. Because uh, like we can just uh, make uh, logging in our debug log, but it's not really the user friendly, I would say. So I implemented this a uh, couple of events and uh, like all the time we do something with account storage, like remove or insert. We uh, push uh, changed index. Index is offset inside of uh, uh, storage for one given contract and address is address of this contract. So uh, basically index is address inside of storage for one contract. And then we uh, take all uh, these indices, uh, filter duplicates, sort it and emit uh, one event with digest of all change. And this, what we received here, just uh, we have only one index because uh, we have only one field in our contract. Yeah, and in case uh, we uh, clear our storage, uh, we need storage reset. 
Yeah, and these events are not emitted in a real portrait event model. It's just for demonstration. Now we can call method to see how this works. So we for this our signature if. Carol, while you're running that, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So, I mean, these events, I mean, when you use the the uh, EVM palette, like you, there's like events internal to it, just like, you know, that are part of the EVM spec. But for any events... Yes, that but I, I'm actually not uh, that sure, like... Mm. That, that may not be the case in this implementation. I guess my, my question was more that the ones that you were seeing that go all the way back to the substrate runtime, those don't come for free, right? That's, you had to write code to basically carry the events back to the substrate runtime, or those, do those somehow, do you get some of that, like with just the, using the, the, you know, the EVM palette? Yeah, I think uh, there is a lot of events, uh, but about created events, I'm actually, I actually don't know. It's probably just a uh, uh, substrate palette. Needs it. So like the, the one you showed, like the storage thing you showed, like you wrote that code, right? To like be able yeah. to detect when that's happening and then mm -hmm. pass the event back to the, the runtime, right? That didn't. Yeah. 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 This uh, storage uh, return stuff is. Yeah. It, it uh, uses kind of like, yeah. Mm, this. Is basically already happened event. Yeah, this is not operational. So yeah, uh, you're right. Yes, uh, there are events coming from uh, this Rust EVM, uh, this account storage is remove or insert, and uh, I just uh, uh, collect them all and uh, digest into like more compact uh, form and uh, emit it in uh, to the user. Right, I understand. Yeah. So let me, Kirill, can I repeat this back? Because this is pretty interesting. So like, I'm looking at the docs just for the regular Palo EVM, and it shows me it has two different kinds of mess of uh, um, not messages, two different two different kinds of events, and one's called created, which has an H160. So I assume that's like I created a contract or something, and then yeah, another oh, one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I guess you're right, yes. I just found uh, the, yeah, create Oh yeah, right, okay. So that comes this, when you create a contract, when you call that function create. Yeah, here in this code, I see that uh, we just emit this uh, created event, uh, like just at the end of our create call. But I guess that inside of uh, Rust EVM, there should be also this event. But to be honest, I didn't dig uh, that uh, deep. Yeah. So okay, right. So there's so there's that one that that already existed in Palette EVM. You didn't write that. And then there's a second oh, one that already okay. exists there, and it's called log. And it's like when you just look at the docs, it's like super generic. It says log, yeah. and the thing it takes is log. And it's like, well, it's what the hell is that? Right. But yeah, the reason it's yeah. Go ahead. Actually, at first, uh, my storage uh, reset and storage uh, return events uh, were just logs. I uh, made uh, dedicated events for this on USB. And uh, yeah, log is uh, quite, uh, it's just for developer, for debugging converts, I guess. Yeah. Super generic. Yeah, right. Okay. So, so we get these two for free, the created one and the log one. And the log one is the one that wraps the like internal to the EVM ones. So I think those internal EVM events do come all the way back out for free. They just have like one extra layer of wrapping, which is the struct called log, which you can, of course, pull off. And then sub or, uh, then Kirill, the, the ones that you've added yourself are the ones about like the storage. Oh yeah, you've got one highlighted right there, like storage written mm -hmm. and I think there was another one. Yeah, and yeah. I also uh, recalling that uh, this log event, uh, it's actually like there is 
if I'm correct, there is instruction in uh, EVM opcode uh, code block. So this log this is emitted uh, can be emitted from smart contract. You can check it on the cool website. Yeah, so that's uh, this event. So basically, uh, it's adapter to Ethereum virtual machine uh, of code. Of code is uh, any instruction of uh, by code. And uh, so I don't know actually how I'm not expert uh, in Solidity, but we can uh, write here something like log. So it's basically uh, debugging print, and this uh, would. Oh yeah, I think it's emit. I think emit is the solidity way to do that. Ah, you mean there is a solidity contract called emit? Sorry, what was that? You mean there is a solidity contract uh, called emit? I think so. Yeah. I guess it should be something like this. Yeah, so let's uh, run method. This is our selector. Selector is uh, something we use uh, to dispatch uh, through table of methods. So uh, how it is built. Yeah, we just take Ketsuk hash and take first 10 character to it. So, and R here is this clip. But it's of course different if we use this or we have spaces. Or, for example, if uh, we use some method. Then uh, spaces also matter. My guess is uh, that uh, this uh, this selector is uh, written into ABI as the, at the time of compilation, and it depends on how it was written in the source code. Like, but I could do it because uh, it can be also that the uh, compiler removed spaces to make it uh, canonical. But uh, during our uh, session, we will just explain it if we will have uh, a few minutes. Yeah, so uh, this for clip is the report because we don't have any argument. Yeah, and the uh, RC EVM call. We need address of our contract. We need selector. Let's just take this first. And address is this from EVM creator. Now, mm, yeah, we don't need uh, to provide any. Uh, Endowment argument because it's not playable function, so it doesn't expect any function to be transferred. I uh, guess price. And we have limit. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you for your text. So storage written, as you see here, storage was written. The same index, zero, and uh, to get new value, I have in this tool set uh, comment info. So we pass uh, address of contract to read storage and uh, index. Yeah. 
here and now we see the this one so we can call again this method so it's it's subtle because it's buried in all of that 256 bytes or bits worth yeah. of zeros but that one is indicating that you flipped the state of that boolean right right yeah uh, now we request it again like ju uh, just now we start hitting again we call uh if and uh, yeah rc info now it's zero and now it's back to false yeah right so we can uh, try now something a bit more uh, complicated like confirming <laughs> What what was that? Uh, incrementer is uh, like if flipper is the most simple contract, the increment uh, takes second place. So it's uh, just one integer value, and uh, we increment it, and we can uh, get ready. Yeah, and uh, in constructor, uh, in this uh, in implementation, I just uh, put uh, that we remember. Uh, number account uh, which was which initialized uh, the contract. So Not enough gas. Something like this, yes. We will see in a couple of seconds. When uh, something is broken on uh, on the model level, it's usually dispatch error. We have three. Okay, there is like there are three. There should be something trivial because I verified this contract before. See if it is. Ah, exit reason revert. Yeah, it seems that not enough gas. Uh, like. Yeah. Like this uh, is um, when we 
be revert uh, execution function. And we can revert uh, it uh, due to multiple reasons, but usually like the simplest case is then uh, when there is not no one else there. Yeah, if somebody is curious uh, and wants to dig it after, then it's quite low level uh, logic of this module. Let's uh, just implement increased amount of gas like to five million. Uh, talking about payable and not payable. Like here in Flipper, mm -hmm. our contract is payable. So it expects oh. uh, some balance to be transferred. Yeah. So this and is actually is, a solidity thing. That one was not marked payable. So when you tried yeah. to send funds to it, it was like, no way, that's not how this contract works or not how this constructor works. Actually, first time, like uh, when I, uh, like, I hit this optical already several times. <laughs> yeah. and the first time when it happened, like I uh, I didn't know that there is a payable in Solidity. Like I mm. thought there is a bug in the RPM, and uh, mm. uh, on like I had to disassemble even bytecode to discover this uh, execution reverse. And uh, then I asked today and and he told me about payable. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's just we don't need to pass. I, th I think the idea behind that is basically like you only mark the thing payable if it has a reason to have funds and if not you don't mark it payable and then your users don't get pissed when they accidentally send money to a contract that can't send it back or something like that. Yeah, right. I think so. Great. So we uh, initiated our implement. And now we see that there are two in that region mm -hmm. because we have two fields, one zero offset and one uh, one offset. So we can uh, look up the field creator. I guess it's zero offset. Should be rcem info address of contact. This one and index. Mm -hmm. So this is address of uh, creator of the account of the contract, and we can glance what's okay. okay. So this is Alice and this media. And yeah, let's look initial value of this comment and in this field. And this is zero as expected. Uh, let's now increment. We take again this signature. We put it into RC with case hash and it is first time symbol and data is our selector and address. It is not payable, so we don't need to pass endowment. We need to always pass get price and 
does that. was expecting one zero but yeah it's fixed yeah well this is the incrementer right so it should just keep going up until it overflows yeah i think we can we can make like you know uh, more than 16. <laughs> yeah cool uh, oh Hmm. But actually, yeah, I noticed, uh, I remember I noticed that events from EM sometimes are uh, lagging, like uh, it will raise due to several uh, multiple transactions, uh, hope, but we still do not receive the storage return event. I don't know why it's happened, but usually they uh, come with delay somehow. Wait, so I, I didn't get quite what you said there. You, you were looking at that indices thing and observing that it always is one. Mm -hmm. So that I think that makes sense, right? Because like that's storage index one is your counter, so it gets written every time. Uh, wait, you mean uh, about Event or? Uh, yeah, I'd, well, I, I wasn't, I, for some reason I was thinking you were like saying something didn't look quite right in that top terminal that you have open now with the yeah. index, but that, that is it, right. It, I think. it doesn't look, it doesn't look right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, an, uh, it's uh, not crystal. Like it's uh, okay. this, events, they somehow uh, delayed. I don't know why. Okay. So especially, uh, I guess, when uh, like we do a lot of transactions, uh, a lot of calls, like uh, like now without stop between two transactions. Mm -hmm. So and this this uh, notifications somehow are lost. I don't know why. But uh, so the, it was one. Ah, it was two, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, made sixteen calls. I guess. Yeah, um, nice. One, yeah, yeah, it's fair. <laughs> yeah, you made 16 yeah. calls, so it incremented the 16th place. So that yeah. looks right. That's good. All right, cool. Play. Should we end it there? Yeah, I think enough. Uh, we can try ERC20, but we need to leave there because. I think let's let's leave the ERC twenty as an an exercise for the reader. I, Kirill, I'd love it if you yeah. also could send us the link to that command line tool that you were using. That looks super super useful. Yeah, um, you wrote yeah. that yourself, right? Yeah, it's basically this uh, like this repo, but for its CLI tool, and uh, it's prototype in TypeScript. Um, I want to implement it in Rust with Subex C, but right now here. On the mock, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and in TypeScript, uh, I implemented several simple tools. Uh, they are mostly copy uh, paste from uh, tutorial web.js uh, API, mm -hmm. uh, except Confex and EVM. Cool. Yeah, very. Yeah, nice. and uh, yeah, these uh, simple tools uh, have a couple of features like events can be filtered. Which I guess is not that easy in a project apps, but basically it's straightforward. Cool. Yeah, what can we make? All right. Good. Well, thank you very much, Kirill, for presenting all the yeah. detailed EVM me. work. I hope it allows a lot more people to start messing with the EVM palette now. Yeah. And yeah. thank you very much, Derek, too, for the, the update on Moonbeam and Pure Stake. No problem.
Yeah, thanks, Carol yeah. and Joshy. Thank you. Cool. All righty. So we'll see you guys. Um, what was that? Yeah, it's a bit more than half. Uh, one hour. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you guys back at the next seminar. Thanks. Thanks for the